guys, how's it going? I hope you're well. I'm in Guangdong province. I've been at a museum for a, uh, an, well, an 800 year old wreckage of a ship called the Nanhai One. That's not the original name, actually. It's just, it's, it's, uh, it's wreck name, actually, because uh, they don't know much about it, uh, about its like life, like where it was headed um, or like the crew aboard it or what it was named. What they can do is they can date it to the time that it sunk and uh, they know what the cargo hold held because when it sunk, it, it, like it basically sank right off the coast here, about 38 nautical miles. And, oh geez, you can see me recording. That looks kind of stupid. I'll open the door so you don't have to see the back of my head anymore. <laughs> okay, there we go. I'm at, I'm at a beachside resort. Anyways, so this uh, Not High One um, sunk 800 years ago, and it was sort of lost to history. Nobody knew uh, really about it. Um, I guess it's kind of interesting. You know, this is along the Maritime Silk Road, so this is where like shipping routes connected China to the Middle East and Europe and India and Southeast Asia. So there was a lot of like fully loaded cargo ships that left here and, and wound around this, this coast. And a lot of them got lost. So many of them that you'd have, I, I would have to imagine that you'd have buyers in different parts of the world that were waiting for goods that just never came. Or, or as an interesting thing, you just had people that were sending out goods at such a quantity that they just knew that half of it or three quarters of it or whatever was gonna get lost potentially by, by shipwrecks. And they just hoped that, that the goods would end up profiting for them. It makes me wonder who, who was the big loser with regards to ships like that? Was it, was it the factories making, okay, l let me tell you. So, so they, this ship was full of porcelain, um, iron goods like like big nails and stuff i mean 800 years ago it's very simple stuff but the the porcelain was quite beautiful full of like like 130,000 pieces of porcelain a lot you know from uh bottles to gourds to bowls to plates uh, all sorts of different things and i'm wondering at that time and this is like honestly i'm just curious how much of that was was brokered so did you have somebody that went to different factories in china and they were like i'm gonna buy all of these porcelain goods and i'm gonna charter a ship to take them at my cost to the middle east or you know along the coast and this person foots the bill for potential buyers that he doesn't even know about because we're talking like so many hundreds of years ago that, you know, you couldn't call, like the way it works today, like I, I, I got to China based on um, trading. So um, the way it worked for me is that I had a buyer in the United States that was looking for a widget, whatever it was, X, Y, or Z. Then he would contract me to design the product if it needed to be designed. And then I would find the factory in China to make it. The factory in China would not start making it until I gave them a deposit on the production. And I wouldn't give them a deposit on the production until the client in the States paid for the goods. So there was always a, a very succinct connection. I knew where the money was coming from and I, and they knew, and I knew where the products were going. But this non high one was carrying, you know, 100,000 plus pieces of, of porcelain and a bunch of like, uh, there was like, a, like, what was it? A 280 uh, a silver, uh, silver um, bricks. And it was carrying gold, uh, copper coins and gold jewelry, all sorts of stuff. But in, eight, in 800 years ago, you couldn't call ahead and say, hey, India, how much of this stuff do you want and start buying based on the need? At least I don't think you could. It would take months and months for even messages to get back and forth. And then you'd have ships are like this that, that were lost. And they said that, 
when the Nanhai one went down, it was lost to history. Like nobody even knew about it because there was probably so many ships that got lost out of the ships that were traversing the Maritime Silk Road that one one more ship wasn't such a such a big deal. Really interesting time back then. Anyways, this ship when it sunk, um, apparently out, out out here it's quite silty, so the the, the hull of the ship descended into the silt and at, at a perfect depth, perfect temperature, and a perfect covering of the silt that it protected the hull. The top of the top deck of the ship ended up disintegrating along with the masts and all the all the sails because it was like one of these like beautiful like beautiful sailing ships, you know. And. Uh, so the cr we couldn't know anything about the crew or the upper deck or or any of that but the hull which held all the merchandise was basically perfect as a matter of fact uh i did this live stream there i'm here for cgtn if you guys don't know um cgtn is like a state-owned media agency here and they hired me to be a, a, a the host of this show called tides of change and this is my last day so this video is just going to be me talking to you guys but tell you what what i've been doing kind of interesting so this Tides of Change show came here and they were talking about the, the shipwreck because there's, there's a beautiful museum here. Like a really gorgeous museum that has, it's, it's like a half of a museum and also half of a restoration center. So they brought the entire hull here. They basically dug underneath the entire remaining wreckage uh, and then they pulled the whole wreckage here and they actually had a, a scaffolding that went out into the beach and they just pulled the entire not even the hull, they pulled the entire piece of land and sludge that the hull was embedded in into the museum, into this special area, filled it full of water because uh, because the wood had been existing in this state for so long uh, in, in salt water, you couldn't just dry it out. Now, like, it is still moist and it's even 20 years into the restoration. It's gonna be 20 more years until they finish and they've just like gotta slowly, slowly work it until they've got it all. Today they have most of the hole exposed, but it's still covered in muck and mud. And uh, this museum is is kind of neat because as they get into this mud, they're uncovering all of this porcelain and products and gold and silver and, and copper coins and everything. And, and the copper coins are being moved and cleaned and then placed inside the main um, main museum area outside of this excavation and restoration area. Really, really cool. I didn't, I didn't record a lot uh, about it uh, with the camera just because I was doing the show. But I'll leave some links to the show. You can see, you can see some of it. There, there were some places during the show that I actually didn't cover that I wanted to. As a matter of fact, there's a segment where they have these big metal, not metal, the stones. The stones are about the size, like if you look at my head, bigger than my head. And uh, they were used in dredging. So like fishermen way, way back in the day would hang heavy nets. They would go down to the, to the ocean floor and then they would dredge along the ocean floor. This is, this aren't, we're not talking about destroying coral. This is like, you know, uh, deeper, deeper than that. 20 meters, 30 meters deep, uh, beyond any place where there would be a reef. And, um, they kept losing nets because the stone weights would get caught in the wreckage. God, you got to think about what damage those might have done to the wreckage over the, over time. But they would get caught in the wreckage and get get torn up, and so people lost their nets so much in that area that it kind of became notorious as a uh, as a trouble zone. You don't want to take your take your fishing there because you're going to lose your nets. But there was all these exhibits set up with all of these weights and stuff signifying the um signifying the lost uh lost nets so there's all these like fishing trawling weights that were stuck there among the other things which were really important and all the all the artifacts and stuff but it just is it's just interesting like it was really in like i don't like to go to many museums they're not really something i enjoy going on like so many pictures i can look at pictures are beautiful and everything a lot of work went into it but it's just not my cup of tea but going to a place where that's focused on restoring a wreck it's like it's like beyond a museum it's it's actually physically 
connecting to the past via this shipwreck and it's in the process of being restored which in itself is kind of neat so it's actually continuous a lot of times when you go to a museum unless it's like a paleontology exhibit where they're like restoring bones and stuff there's not like a lot of stuff happening it's just stuff that's happened and you're watching it whereas this place was interesting because they were in the process of recovering the non high one which was very cool. Nanhai, if you guys are wondering, it means South China Sea, so Nanhai, South China. And then so it's basically uh, a ship that's wrecked in the South China Sea, so that was the moniker they gave it. There's actually an other Nanhai recovery efforts uh, in the area of different ships that, that went down during that, that time period, and uh, recovery of those are, there are happening as well. But yeah, it was very, very interesting to do that. Is it, it was a nice end cap to this CGTN trip. Um, it was, it's been a really nice trip, actually. What a perfect... If I could do this all the time, I would be very happy. Um, going out there, showing interesting sides of China that, that aren't crazy political and motivation or, or getting anything you say. Anything you say in China that's, that's good is going to get you in trouble with a certain group and I just can't cater my messages to that group because um, I enjoy uh, I enjoyed this trip it was it was had some scuba diving we had coral we had um, oysters which <laughs> yesterday and the day before I did that show where I ate those oysters in a live stream if you saw I ate I feel like I ate dozens of oysters and they were big oysters and I thought I was doing okay until the next morning when it hit my stomach. And then I was, I've, I've been taking medicine for, for oyster. Oyster, I overdosed on oysters. And I, I don't think, I don't think that's anything held against the oysters themselves. I think you couldn't get fresher oysters and oysters pulled right out of the bay there or the riverbanks. But I think from going from a guy who, who hasn't had oysters in a year and probably even even then, it was like one or two or three um, to eating like a dozen extremely hefty meaty oysters in a bunch of different preparation methods. You're gonna get, <laughs> your body, my body was not interested in negotiation. It was like, let's figure this, th there's too much of this stuff in here, get it out. Anyways, I've had a rough couple of days, but I'm okay now, I think I'm good. Um, tonight, uh, me and the, the crew here from CGTN are going to go out and have uh, a bit of a party. We're going to go KTV, and, which is like a bunch, like what people do socially here. And we'll sing songs. They'll tell me to sing songs. I'll tell them I don't sing songs, and then we'll all be jolly, jolly and laugh about it. Well, it was very interesting. There's a guy named Omar who's a Canadian um, that uh, is, a, is, a, is a reporter and a correspondent, a co reporter. And uh, really, really nice guy. His Chinese is really good. He speaks really well, fluently. And he was even joking with every, last night we were out having a couple of drinks and he was jokingly uh, conversing with the different people in the different dialects. So he was, one of the uh, reporters uh, was from Chongqing and she was, she was talking Chongqing and, and uh, Omar was like talking in Chongqing dialect. Not just like, like I can speak Ningbo dialect a little bit, you know, not Na Ho and Jimatiku Jugo Ho and some sentences. But he was actually conversing, oh yeah, this way and that way, and it was quite, quite cool, you know, to see. It's inspiring to see a guy that converses well in Chinese. And I've been studying my Chinese. You know, uh, if you watch my other channel, Nuance, I made a whole episode in Chinese and I'm trying to. Um, increase my Chinese ability and, and while we've been on this tour I've been studying the next script for for that I wrote I write the whole thing in Chinese like I have a system I actually want to tell you about my system for trying to use my channel uh, nuance to learn Chinese and also express ideas and the next one I'm working on should be should be interesting but yeah it's been quite nice like the perfect trip now they they came up to me actually and they want me to do more of these there's a trip that's across Inner Mongolia, a road trip. That would be with Daniel Dumbrell and uh, Jing Jing. And then there's another trip in Tibet, all in a couple of months time. I don't know if I'll be able to do them, but the door is open and uh, I have a bunch of things happening. I've got, I've got this CGTN show, which has some momentum. I have a show that's come up on uh, CCTV that's another travel show. And then I have another show I'm going after this one. I'm going on a Xinhua trip while I'm 
I'm going to be a village leader, which you're going to see in the following episodes after this one, where I'll be posing as a village leader in some sort of a reality show where a foreigner is tasked with helping a village um, raise their crops or, or something. It's going to be fun. It, it should be interesting. The, the story is interesting. And it should be nice. That's in Shanxi. That's a, it's quite a flight from here. So tomorrow we're driving to the airport. I'm driving four hours from here. Um, it's not the end of the Tides of Change show though. It's, it's going to continue on for a few more days. I just had to leave early because my, my, uh, my, this other trip cut into the timing. So the Tides of Change show will, will continue. It's called Tides of Change, this whole series. But it's been so nice. And you know the other thing that's been nice is I've, I've really enjoyed meeting the entire team. They've got, they've got directors and executive producers and they've got camera people and sound people and they've got engineers that are doing um, sound and, uh, and they've got editors and they've got writers and they've got people that are syncing it all up and sending sending it to Beijing it's it's it is it is great like I would even say like it's neat to be a fly on the wall but I'm not a fly on the wall I'm actually a participant so it's neat to be a participant and um, also to see how my abilities would gel in a in a type of event like this and it I got some confidence I feel I feel I could do I could do TV pretty easily, or I could do a, a higher caliber production pretty easily. Um, you know, they'd give me some guide. They say we want you to kind of talk about the ship today, and to, like today I did a live stream all by myself. So they they're like you're going to be talking by yourself, and then you'll bring a guest in, and and these are the topics. And I started doing it, and it was it was quite quite second nature. As a matter of fact, some of the anchors were coming up to me and they're like Matt your style is so casual it takes us so long to to prepare and we come from a news background so we have to talk like this welcome to another episode of CGT and today we're gonna discuss X Y and Z whereas I'm like hey guys today look at look at this ship this is really interesting and asking questions I mean being more natural that's kind of my forte and it was it was kind of neat to have people whose profession was to talk uh, in a more professional regard look at me as having attribute, attributes that they would like. And that was a nice appreciation there. They're like, Matt, you know, you, you're very natural. It's very difficult for us to speak so naturally as you do. What, uh, you, well, how do you do it? That was neat, that was neat. Anyways, so we're gonna go to KTV later. This, this trip is gonna wrap up. So this is my, my wrap up and review. Actually, after talking to you guys a little bit, it would have been nice to actually do a video at the Nanhai One Exhibition Center, but or, or museum. But I just sort of got caught up in things. I did film a little video there. I, I, I wonder if I'm going to put it on the channel anytime soon. Um, I have a lot of content you guys obviously right now have seen because by the time I post this video, I'm going to have to have wrapped up this whole event. So I hope you enjoyed everything I had, and I hope it was all relevant on this channel and on Nuance. And uh, yeah, if you'd like to follow me, please do so. Uh, I've got a Patreon where you can join on and see some things. I've been actually recording podcasts on my Patreon uh, from time to time, posting on this trip so that people can hear what's going on, if, even if I'm not posting any videos. I had a live stream, kind of some live streams on this trip that you saw as well that, that you can check out. I've got a channel called Nuance where I get in, into some more political or um, um, socio, uh, socio-economical or cultural topics that don't uh, bide well with simple tr simple travel videos like this. So check those out if you're interested. Otherwise, um, we'll talk to you later. And uh, thanks for joining me on this so far. It's been a lot of fun. Ciao. Bye-bye. <laughs>